guys for having the guts to campaign in Illinois. It's not safe. No, we campaign everywhere. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Um, on the uh, wars that are going on over there, Obama is starting to draw troops out, and the biggest fear that most intelligent people have is that if we withdraw prematurely, it's just going to reinvigorate the terrorists, and we're going to have to go back in a short time anyway to finish out what we're not finishing out now. Uh, when you become president, thank uh, you. Are you, to God's to, ears, right? are, are you going to continue with the withdrawal, or are you going to re-escalate? The first or? thing I will do is I will cancel the withdrawal. It is folly. It is dangerous. It is irresponsible. It is unpresidential for a president of the United States to put a withdrawal date on a foreign engagement, foreign military engagement. All you do is you tell the people who are for you that you're not going to be there till they're successfully, uh, the, the, no, till the mission I is successful. Agree, but I mean, since and you've already started this policy, and you're, right. what, what's the risk of re-escalating? I'm not talking about re-escalating. What I'm talking about is telling the people on the ground, remember, history. The history with the Afghanistan people was we were for them, and then we sort of bailed out. Okay? You saw, you've seen the... Uh, I forget what the name of the movie is, where the helicopter flies away, and, and the, we were supporting the Mujahideen until, well, we stopped supporting the Mujahideen, okay, against, uh, against the Russians. And we, we have a real trust issue in that country, and it's back. They want to know, just like anybody would want to know, that you're here to finish the job, and you're going to be there, and that they can trust that you'll be there, and you'll be good partners. I'm not suggesting that we've been good partners. I'm not suggesting we haven't wasted a tremendous amount of... We've done a lot of things wrong. But the one right thing we need to do is to say we're going to be there until our national security interests have been served, which means the chance of a Taliban coming back is de minimis. Okay? That is not what the President has laid out. He's laid out a plan that's a political one. Uh, we're going to withdraw our troops before the next election. I mean, that's, it's just like political plan for this, for the, uh, for the uh, debt ceiling. We need, the, the long-term plan is after November of 2012. We've got to have the debt ceiling extended until after my election. It, it, if you just look at the, look through the glass, this press, it's all about him. It's all about politics. Uh, Afghanistan is not about politics. It's about making sure that we do not reconstitute a country that can be a breeding place for the same kind of threats that hit us on 9 11. And if you think that the Islamic threat has, a radical Islamic threat has gone away, you're not paying attention to what's going on around the world. It's present, it's dangerous, and it's, th and it's not just there, it's, it's in our backyard, and it's, and it's south of our border, and it's in our hemisphere. And so we need to say, as I have, we need a commitment to fighting this. First thing, remove the deadline. Uh, second thing is follow through and with the Afghani people now re-engaged that we are going to be there until stability is in place. We have a problem with the, uh, with the current government, government of Afghanistan and we need to transition to a government that the people there will accept, which has historically been a fairly loose confederation of regional, whether it's tribal or regional, with a very, very weak central government. That's how those, that area has worked well and successfully for a long time. And we need to get back to something they're comfortable with and they can live. Anybody else? I'm not shy. Go ahead. On your energy policy, are you going to open up the Anwar, the natural gas? Yes, 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 and yes. I think that about it. My, feel, my feeling is, I, you know, I come from Pennsylvania. We uh, first oil well was in Pennsylvania, the Drake Well in Titusville, Pennsylvania. Uh, we have now found the largest natural gas reserve in the history of the country underneath Pennsylvania. It's called Marcellus Shale. Uh, it's the second largest gas field in the world. And guess what's happened to gas prices in the United States since we found that field about three, four years ago? Natural gas prices, not 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 oil prices. Natural gas prices have gone down, and they're now flat, and they will be 
Why? Because we have a plentiful domestic supply. Okay. Gee, I wonder what, hap what would happen if we actually drilled for oil and had plentiful domestic supply. Okay? We have a president who thinks who, who didn't, he, he missed half of his economics classes. He, he, he went to all the economics classes that talked about doing that, that prices determined by demand, and he missed the economics classes in Economics 101 that talked about the, imp the importance of supply. Because when you look at the president's policies, it's all demand oriented. We can only get price down if we reduce demand, if we conserve, if we, you know, put uh, all sorts of constraints on people consuming energy. And he makes fun, pokes fun at people that say, oh, drill, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that'll never solve the problem. Well, we're drilling in Pennsylvania. We're drilling 3,000 gas wells this year alone. Now, Pennsylvania, it's not, it's a lot more mountains, but it's not that dissimilar from Iowa in the sense there's people all over Pennsylvania. It's not like we're concentrating this. People think Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. Pennsylvania has the large, second largest rural population in the country. So when we're drilling wells, we're drilling in people's backyards. We're drilling on their farm. And it's not an Iowa farm. It's not thousands of acres. It's hundreds of acres or dozens of acres. And we're drilling there. And farmers are very happy, thank you very much, because they're going to have royalties for as far as the eye can see, 30, 40 years of very nice royalties. We're transforming rural Pennsylvania, just like ethanol in some respects, and wind power here is transforming some areas of Iowa. So my feeling is, produce all the energy we can here. Quit subsidizing. Any of it. Let the market work. Open up Alaskan oil. Open up offshore oil. Open up deep water drilling. Let the marketplace work and produce energy here. Have responsible, not draconian, environmental regulation that works with folks to make sure that we can produce it as opposed to trying to choke off any kind of development. There are clean ways of doing everything we want to do when it, when it comes to energy production. We just need to make sure and work with businesses to make sure that happens as opposed to uh, being punitive when it comes to uh, enforcing regulations. What did you mean that, that, that there's extremism in our hemisphere? Uh, as far as uh, jihadism, uh, we do very strong documentation of jihadist training camps, uh, particularly in South America, uh, working with a lot of the uh, narco-terrorists. I mean, this is a source of money for, for the jihadists, uh, as well as obviously the narco-terrorists. And, and there's, a, there's, there's growing complicity. We see it with Hugo Chavez in Venezuela and his relationships with Iran and other, other jihadist countries and having, I think there are three or four daily flights that go from Tehran to Damascus to Caracas, Venezuela. And when the plane arrives, they don't go to the civilian terminal. They stop at the military base first before they go to the terminal. So there, there are all sorts of relationships there that are not healthy relationships that are breeding uh, problems south of our border, which makes our border an issue. Uh, obviously an issue with respect to the economics of it, the national security point, obviously the dangerous nature of what's going on at the border right now, we've seen reports on. Uh, but we also have a terrorist implication in making sure that we have to secure that border and make sure that border is secure for, from, for a national security point of view. So, uh, yeah, there's, uh, again, something that we have not paid attention to, frankly, under either the Bush or, or Obama administration is developing stronger ties with our allies in Central and South America, not just for economic purposes, but for national security purposes and this one. What does your bracelet say? This one? This says family. Okay. I was given this bracelet about 10 years ago. I was speaking at a uh, conference on marriage, uh, at a Christian conference in Kansas, and uh, my wife and I were actually speaking together and we were talking about how do you, how did, how was it, one of the elements of a successful marriage. And, uh, we were talking about sacrificial love and you know uh, the idea of not going into marriage thinking of what it can do for you, but it's an us, it's a we, and all this kind of stuff. And so this guy came up to me afterwards and says, I want you to wear this bracelet. He said, this is, this, this is what you've been talking about. And I said, okay, well, what's this bracelet said? He says, family. I said, I see that. I can read. He <laughs> said, so, so he said, well, he says, forget about me, I love you is what, this, what that stands for. And so uh, 
I thought that was a, in, the, in Washington, D.C., that's a good reminder to always have on your wrist uh, to remember the importance of your family and the importance of what you, as a husband and father, what your role is in that family. So that's why we're here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't support the, uh, the subsidies. When I was in Congress, I didn't support any energy subsidies, period. Uh, I just didn't feel like we should be picking winners and losers out there and, and saying this power is better than this power. Um, the, the only subsidies I'm aware of with respect to, uh, to the drilling in Pennsylvania is for small producers, and there is a, there's a tax credit for for drilling for small producers. And what I've said is, uh, you know, that needs to go with every other subsidy. That, you know, you know there's, uh, we need to let the market work, and if we let the market work here, I think it can be effective. And I've said that with oil and gas, I've said it with, uh, with ethanol. I, mean, I uh, believe that we need to phase out the ethanol subsidies uh, over a five year period of time. I think we need to do it gradually. I think the ethanol industry has done a good job, an amazing job, a, a job that the media and they have done a very bad job of telling their story. It's actually a pretty good story that they can tell. Uh, the more I've come to Iowa, the more I've learned about it. But even in spite of the good story of uh, how productive they can and they've become and how efficient that the uh, operations have become, that's a, to me it's a testament that they can survive without the subsidies and show. And so we're going to phase them out over five years. Uh, in talking to the industry, they, they would like a little help in the transition with respect to distribution. So every, it's a 45% blender, 45 cent blender's credit, so five and nine cents a year phases out. Every year we're going to dedicate four and a half cents to, uh, to help expand the distribution network for ethanol at the gas pump. So to create uh, an incentive for fill-in stations to uh, put pumps in that can do different blends of ethanol, so, we, so there's a market. And I do understand that, you know, eth ethanol industry is trying to sell into a distribution network that is owned by the oil industry, by the way. And so, you, you, you know, creating, uh, creating a level playing field is hard unless you, unless you create access into that system. Yes, ma'am. Are you aware that our First Lady Mamie Dowd Eisenhower was born in Boone, Iowa. I did not. And know would that. you uh, ever plan to visit? It might make points. Well, uh, it's open at ten o'clock today. I don't know if we can swing by there on the way. <laughs> yeah, it's just a couple blocks. Okay, away. well then we'll swing by on the way. Uh, well, you know, we, we we claim a little Eisenhower too in Pennsylvania. Yeah, did you know? I understand. So only have... home they owned was. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Gettysburg. Yeah. In Gettysburg. Well, I guess that's right. He was in the military all that time. So, yep. So, the Eisenhower Farm. If you guys have not been to that, so if you're from Boone, you have to go to the Eisenhower, you have to go to the Eisenhower Farm in Gettysburg. And uh, one of the things I was most proud of when I was in the United States Senate was when I got to get, when I came into the United States Senate in Gettysburg. This is long, I'll, I'll give you the very brief history. I went to the battlefield, and it was a mess. It was really sad. Uh, you had great uh, markers. You know what they call flank flank. You know. Markers for where the regiments were, were, you know, they have little markers there where they lined up on certain days so you could get a sense of the battlefield. They had cannon carriages and other types of things. It was in a state of disrepair. It was pathetic. Cannon carriages were falling apart. Um, uh, the, the park was overgrown. Imagine you had a battlefield. 150 years later, if you don't do anything, guess what? Trees grow. You know, things grow, and, and the battlefield, from the standpoint of you know, you read in the history that General Hancock standing here and he looked off to his left and saw the Alabamans coming up and he ordered the Minnesotans to do this. Well, you look over there and the wall of trees, you can't, it was impossible. You can't see. You couldn't see it. So uh, we had a whole bunch of issues there, including a visitor center that had basically started out as a house and had just been added on to and was horrible. We had, and all of it sat right in the middle of the battlefield. So you had the you had buildings and parking lots and all this stuff right in the middle of the battlefield. So uh, 
So when I went there, I, I came up with this idea that we needed to tear all this down, we needed to take the trees out, prepare the cartridges, and build a brand new visitor center that was state of the art, behind the battle lines, not anywhere near the field. You couldn't even see it from the field. So when you're on the field, you actually had a sense of what it was like that day. Because uh, I think that that site, Gettysburg, is you know, one of the most important sites in American history. Uh, not just for the battle, but for the speech that was given uh, some uh, four months after the battle, four and a half months after the battle, uh, at the uh, dedication of the, of the cemetery in Lincoln's Gettysburg Press. So uh, I went about and did a public-private partnership. Uh, we did public money to repair the, you know, to take the trees out and the cannon carriages were on the mountain. The whole visitor center thing, we did all three with private money and redid the whole thing and now it is a something you need to go see. Very, that's one of the things I'm very proud of. We restored a little bit of history. Any other questions? Yes, sir. We have two Minnesota candidates, and as a first mile, that means nothing to me. Okay. But he's, he's, and I appreciate you as, uh, addressing the issue of that Obama is all for himself. We've had two Minnesota candidates, especially been going back and forth and accusing this person of not accomplishing much and stuff. I know Ronald Reagan, when he ran, he basically didn't run up down other Republican candidates. And I, I've been impressed today that you haven't done that. What do those candidates need to do, or what, what are you planning on doing to stay above the trade? Well, I mean, look, I, I think there's legitimate, if you're, if you're talking about issues, obviously, uh, we're going to talk Obamacare. I mean, I would say that those people who are for individual mandates and for government-run health care on a state level versus a national level, I think they're just as wrong. The state level as it was because going back to the theory I talked about before, bottom up, top down. Uh, and so if they're getting back and forth about, and I haven't been following it that closely, about substantive issues, uh, that's okay. I mean, you know, you can't, you, 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 got, you got to differentiate yourself. I mean, the, one of the things I talked about is that I have accomplishments. And there are people who, you know, uh, if, you, if you look at their record and what they accomplished or didn't, there are different candidates who have... Uh, various levels of college, I think I can match up well against any of them. I don't have to tear them down, but I, I will point out that there is a difference. I will point out that I've been consistently conservative. And I'm not going to point out that where the others, you guys are smart enough to figure out where they haven't been, uh, but there's certainly a lot of candidates in this race who have not been consistently conservative over time. And I think when you're looking at choosing a leader who's going to go into Washington, D.C. and be faced with a very hostile press corps, a very hostile environment in Washington, where it's easy to get off the path very quickly, as we've seen many, many Republicans do when they get there. I've been there, I've been tested, and I didn't wait. That doesn't mean I didn't compromise on things, and I didn't, uh, you know, sure I did. But if you look at the things that I led on, and the areas that I talked, that, that, I, that I, I took the lead on, consistently down the line some things that people would be very proud of here in Iowa uh, among, among, the, uh, among the caucus goers. So I feel, I feel very good that we have a good contrast uh, and I can talk about the things I've done and compare it generally with everybody else. Uh, now, you know, I'm not saying that if there's a debate and somebody says something I'm not going to engage. I mean, that's part of the process. But it needs to stay on the issues. And I think that's the important thing. That, you know, this, this idea of of going after someone be because of some character issue, I, I stay on the issues. Folks, it's been a thrill and an honor to be here with you tonight, or today, rather. I'm already thinking about where we're going to end up tonight. Sioux City. <laughs> Sioux City, wow. This is the second city on a 50-city tour that the senator is going to be on for the next 19 days. And uh, before we say goodbye, we just need you to take a moment and take out a pen or a pencil and fill this out. We have free straw poll tickets to give you. You, your family, friends, maybe people from your church or your community who want to come on Saturday, August 13th to the big Iowa presidential straw poll, which is the first big event of the entire electoral uh, primary season. And so go ahead and fill that out. And when you leave today, uh, Jake is going to be collecting them. We're going to 
turn the senator loose so he can visit Mamie Dowd Eisenhower's uh, little home where she was born just a block and a half away. And we want to make sure we get a picture of the senator there next to the first lady's house. And I'll tweet it out so I can yeah. say that we're here. <laughs> Is there any thought you want to leave us I, with? Just sir? first off, thank you for being here. I appreciate you coming out on a, obviously a Tuesday morning and uh, it's a busy time. And for people to take the time to come here, I greatly appreciate it. And I know we're small in number, but as you all know, uh, uh, if you go out and uh, spread the word and talk to your friends and neighbors, and as Jamie said, you can uh, you can turn this into a very big uh, big deal for us. And obviously, we're I always call our campaign the little engine that could campaign. That was my favorite story as I was a kid growing up. Was the little engine that could. And uh, we're uh, we're out there with not the most money, but uh, certainly with the most heart. Uh, with, uh, with the desire to, uh, to take that train up and get it over the mountain and be successful, not just in winning this election uh, in this primary, but one of the things I think is very, very important is we need a candidate to win a general election. Uh, I'm from Pennsylvania. I got elected twice in a state that has a million more Democrats than Republicans as a conservative, the most conservative elected since before the Great Depression in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I got reelected in a year that George Bush lost the state, the only Republican to win a state that George Bush lost in the year 2000. Uh, I got elected twice. Uh, the first three times I ran, I ran against Democratic incumbents, three and zero. No one else in this race has ever beat a Democratic incumbent. I beat three. In two in, two in tough districts in the House and one in the, in the state of Pennsylvania, in a state that we need to be competitive. Uh, so. I've got a track record to, so I've been talking about the policy side and what I can accomplish when I get there, but I've got to get there. I mean, if you look at some of the other candidates, uh, you know, just, you have some who haven't won any elections. You have some that have, uh, you know, been elected in, uh, I mean, go through all of them. I mean, I go through all of them. None of them have been a Democratic incumbent. We have a congresswoman. She's won a safe Republican district twice, three times, but it's a safe Republican district. Uh, Tim Pawlenty's got elected a few times, but never got 50% of the vote in Minnesota. Uh, and we got, we did. We were able to get 50% of the vote, and then some in Pennsylvania. Uh, Mitt Romney's won once, twice, excuse me, lost once, and won one term, as, as, but didn't stand for re-election. Uh, so, I mean, if you want to look at electoral history of someone who's been able to get into tough races and win, I won because I, I stood up and fought for what I believed in. I stood up and was able to challenge the, the, the status quo and, and be successful. So you want to nominate someone that you can believe in, someone you can trust, and someone who can win, and then someone who can govern. I think on all of those, all of those boxes, we do very, very well. And so uh, our, our uh, you know, it would be a great thing for us to do well at the Strong. I think that will, right now, we've run a different campaign. We've run a grassroots campaign. I don't know, you can run a grassroots campaign for president, but we are. And uh, I believe in Iowans that, uh, that they'll, they'll measure up the candidates you know, and, and if they compare them on everything from political capabilities to governmental capabilities to policy, we stack up very, very well. And hopefully that will be reflected in names. Uh, that'll give us an opportunity to show that the, um, the grassroots effort that we're doing here, we're not on TV. We won't be on TV anytime soon, let me assure you. Uh, but we'll be in your neighborhood, and we'll be working hard here. Instead of going to New York and Dallas and places and raising money, we'll be in we'll be in Boone, and we'll be uh, we'll be talking to folks who can uh, who can go out and, and, and deliver that message for us in your community. And hopefully, you can organize a bus or a few car loads and, and get to Ames for us and help us out. And we'll surprise a lot of people. Uh, we'll surprise a lot of people who, you know, I always say the national media has not given me a lot of attention, but I, I look at that this way. If I was the national media, let's look at the national media. Do they want to put forward the strongest conservative candidate against Barack Obama? Mm -hmm. okay. Rick, what's your position on term limitations? I've supported them in the past. In fact, when I was, uh, I got elected in 1994 to the United States Senate, and the first thing I did along with John Kyle is we instituted term limits of committee chair in the United States Senate, as well as uh, in leadership positions. All but one, the leader is not term limited. But everybody else in leadership is term limited. So Chuck Grassley, for example, is no longer chairman of the finance, or ranking on the finance committee. Why? Because he served his six years, and now he's gone. What's so, the possibility that it really happened? Well, I mean, we, we did it where we could. 
where I could, which is on just among Republicans. Democrats don't have it, but we Republicans do. As far as broader term limits, uh, you know, I'm, I'm for term limits as long as they're not too short. I think that there was a term limit pledge that came out that said two terms for a senator, three for a House member. I wouldn't sign it. Six years in the House is way too short a period of time. I, if you have just the House members churning every six years, you're just not going to have any institutional memory. You're not. The staff will run the place. It already runs it too much already. And you need to have some people who are, who are there who have some experience. And it's like any other job. Uh, you don't want people there forever, but you do want people there a, 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 a period of time so you have within the membership leadership as opposed to the staff who has all the, all the power and information. So that's, that's why I didn't sign the term limits place. But it's not that I'm against term limits. I just don't want them to be too short. I just want to say I think some presidential candidates run so they can put on the resume former presidential candidate. I don't think you're running just to be on your resume former presidential candidate. Look, I, we, as we mentioned before, I have seven children. Thank you. Uh, ages 20 to 3. Not exactly the best time of my life to be running for president. I'll be honest with you. And if it wasn't for the fact that I, and I, you know, I don't, I mean, I talk about this publicly because I'm a person of faith and I, I feel like this is what I was called to do. And I don't know, it doesn't mean necessarily I'm called to win because, of course, we're called to do things and, and, and for a lot of reasons. But uh, I feel like uh, this is, I need to be doing this for my family, uh, for my country. It's been a great country to me and to my family, and, and uh, I feel like this is uh, something that, that, that our country needs. So greatly appreciate it. If you could sign that up and help out by, by getting us some more people, that would be terrific. Thank you. God bless. Thank you.